Good evening to all of you. Sorry for speaking in uh, English with my Norwegian accent rather than in proper German or Aust with Austrian uh, accent. But I'm very happy to be with you tonight. I also say that I'm always extremely happy when I, uh, I'm visiting Vienna. Uh, my main interest in life is history. Uh, and there is no better place than beautiful city of Vienna if you take an interest in history. I mean, my nation, uh, up to 1850, there was hardly a city with 50,000 people uh, uh, in that part of the world, uh, while Vienna was a, a world center for, 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 for centuries, and also in the 20th century, for sure, has been an absolute center for many of, many of the great thoughts which are spread to the rest of the world. So, happy to be with you, though the topic to, of today will not be Austria, but the wider, wider world. If you take an interest in development, I would suggest that there is one, the ultimate place on planet Earth to study the topic of uh, development. Uh, and that is to go to a place con called Panmunjom. That is the borderline between North and South Korea. North of that borderline, you will still see people doing the energy in the agriculture by their own body. You will see stunted children, not grown up to the normal height. You will see people who have been suffering from an enormous starvation. You will see one of the really poor societies on planet Earth. South of Pamujan, you will see a nation now as rich as Austria, uh, with brilliant brands dominating the world. I mean, if you go to the streets of Vienna, you will I see a lot of Hyundai cars. Many of you may have Samsung uh, uh, cellular phones. I think Samsung is not the biggest seller of mobile phones in the world. When I went to my Paris shop the other day to ask for a new TV, the guy there said, well, if you want a new TV, the bird leader is Samsung coming from Korea. And, and Korea, South Korea, even dominating to a large extent the cultures there. The biggest hit ever on YouTube is Gangnam Style. I've seen it, I think, 10 times with my son. Uh, and it has now closed to reach 2 billion hits uh, at, uh, at the YouTube. Let's reflect about what is the difference between North and South Korea. I mean, it's for sure not culture. It's not religion. Uh, it's not history. It was one nation throughout history. It's not raw materials. There are more raw materials in the North than in the South. It's just one difference, ladies and gentlemen, between North and South Korea. And that is between a nation basically getting all political decisions wrong and a nation basically getting all position, uh, political decisions right. A nation not unleashing the power of the private sector uh, and a nation brilliant in exactly that, unleashing the power of the private sector. That is the difference. And that's why people in South, uh, in South are now uh, uh, as rich as Europe, as democratic as Europe, as green as Europe, with much lower unemployment than Europe, while the North is one of the poorest and most downtrodden societies on Earth. So getting the politics right is the key to development. Uh, let me give, I can give you examples from all over the globe. Let me give you just one more. In 1980, the GDP per capita in China was 200 American dollars. Now it's 6,000 American dollars. Shanghai is outperforming all of us, and even China at large, in education. And it's an enormous, fantastic development success. It's the greatest development success any time, anywhere in history, nowhere else, so many people have come out of poverty at such a short time as in uh, uh, China in the last three decades. It started with a change in the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. That was the main event. Deng Xiaoping becoming the emperor of China, putting the Gang of Four in prison. And from that point on, China has had 10% economic growth every year. Again, unleashing the power of the private <coughs> sector, why the Gang of Four tried to, to uh, stop the private sector expanding into uh, society. The debate on whether we need a strong private sector is over. Uh, it was popular, I, I myself belong to the left. 
It was popular at some point in history by the left to see private sector basically as something usurping uh, people. The more investment, the poorer people will be. That debate is over. It's closed because we all know the conclusion. There is no real development anywhere in the world without a vibrant private sector. Only those with enormous uh, growth ties uh, can uh, 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 avoid uh, seeing that. And nearly all the successful nations on the earth have good leadership. Uh, they have a pragmatic view. They want to have both a strong state as well as a vibrant private sector. The ruling ideology of those nations who are really successful, I think was very much, very good presented by the Prime Minister of Singapore. And if it is next to South Korea and China, a real success story is Singapore. I mean, an enormous poor city in the 1950s. Now, I think with a GDP per capita higher than Austria, uh, at least if you compare for purchasing power and capacity. It's one of the richest nations in the world. It was one of the poorest nations in the world. The Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee, was asked, what is the ideology of Singapore? What is your ism? What, what, what's the, um, the ideology, ideological underpinning of this success? Well, I said for sure it's not communism. Nor is it socialism. Nor is it conservatism. Nor is it liberalism. We have one ruling ideology in Singapore, he said, that is pragmatism. We believe in when we see something work, we try to do more of that. When we see something which doesn't work, we try to avoid duplicating our mistakes. And that has been a fantastic success. And one part of that is for sure that you need both to build a state and you need a strong, vibrant private sector. And it's these kind of policies which have led to a situation very contrary to what people tend to believe. When people watch TV, they tend to believe that the world is a horrible place, going from bad to worse. Let us agree here that the absolute contrary is the truth. The average European is 11 centimeters taller than we were in the 19th century. We are much fatter, but basically for good. And the average human being is much better educated, much better health than at any other point in history. Adding to that, even with what we see in Ukraine and other places, Syria, there is much less violence on planet Earth than there was historically. We are, we are the most lucky generation the most lucky time in the most lucky nations which has ever existed. When I was born, and well, I'm old, but I'm not that old. When I was born, average life expectancy on planet Tellus was 46 years. Now it's 70, or at least very close to 70. Uh, by and large, I mean, at the time of Adam and Eve, we don't know the life expectancy. There was no statistical bureau to, to, to judge at that time, but by and large, life expectancy would have been around 30 at the time of Adam and Eve. It increased to 46 at the time of Winston Churchill, and it has increased to, uh, to uh, 70 at the time of Barack Obama. I once said this on, uh, on radio, and then I got a, got a letter from an old lady saying that, well, it was nice what you said, but on one matter you are completely wrong. Adam and Eve they didn't die at the age of 30 because they became 900 years according to the Bible. So I checked up that, and according to the Bible, Adam and Eve became 900 years. But for the rest of the people living at that time, it's still believed that life expectancy were uh, in, in the 30s. So the debate about do we need a vibrant private sector to produce the underpinning for growth is over. The only discussion remaining, and that's what I will speak about, is how do we get more and better private investment? How do we, yes, frame the market? How do we, as development partners, support private sector? And how do we avoid when there are bad practices from private sector? I'll give you four main thoughts. Number one is maybe very obvious, but still sometimes necessary to say. The most important private sector do is to be good at what it's good at. That's simply doing private sector investment and work. Simply establishing businesses and getting them work. The most important private sector is, does is not to establish a kindergarten or some social program. That may be nice, may be fine, there's nothing wrong with that. 
that if your basic investment is wrong, it cannot be compensated with a kindergarten. If your basic investment is good, it's good even if you have no kindergarten. So getting the business at the core, business right, is the main issue for the private sector. And that's what we really need the private sector for. That for sure means aligning with government priorities. One of my uh, heroes is the uh, Ethiopian just dead Prime Minister, Mele Senavi. Probably the one man who has uh, developed his African nation the most over the last two decades. When he came to my nation, we had a meeting of all uh, the private sector. What did Mele Senavi tell them? Well, he said, we need you. Please come and invest. We need your knowledge, your capacities, your money, but in particular, we, we need your brains and your techno technology because we don't have that in Ethiopia. We cannot really develop without, without you. But, he said, we also, we are the masters in Ethiopia. We make the development strategy of Ethiopia. Please align with that strategy. By the way, that's also to a large extent about energy, which is a core, uh, core capacity of Austria, so you could easily align with that strategy. If you cannot align with our strategy, he said, well, then please go to some other nation, because there are many other opportunities for investment. And all the business people like to hear that. They wanted to align with the strategy, and that's also why uh, the UPS has been so much more successful than many other nations. Some Chinese companies, who want to invest in manufacturing in Africa decide to do it in Ethiopia. Why is that? Remember that there is hardly any true manufacturing in Africa. There's agriculture in Africa, there's a lot of oil and gas and mining and extractives, but manufacturing, clothes production for instance, for the European American market, simply at this stage, hardly happens in Africa. It happens in Bangladesh, in Vietnam, in China, in many other places, but not in Africa. And why is that? because there are huge difficulties investing at the, at the moment in Africa, and then you need a government to want to assist you. The Chinese companies are now starting production in manufacturing in, in Ethiopia, producing for the global market, producing shoes that will go into different other kinds of government, but they needed the support of the Prime Minister to cut through bureaucracy, to make certain that when they're moving the products from Ethiopia to the harbor in Djibouti, there's no harbor in Ethiopia, they could do it without any kind of bribes or any other difficulties. So business need government, but the main, main, main issue for business is to do business right. And there's nothing wrong with, with this. You should feel pr proud of it. There should be no super profit, but you should be proud of investing and in getting people to work, providing jobs and providing prosperity. And you should demand from politicians that they defend you. Quite often, if a business invests in a difficult neighborhood, it can come up for some kind of criticism. Let me give you one example from my portfolio. Uh, the Norwegian company Telenor is one of the biggest investors in the telecommunications sector in nations like Bangladesh and Pakistan. For sure, you get into difficulties when you invest in the Anabu Myanmar. Difficulties if you invest in, in these areas. And some newspapers made a huge sensation story out of the fact that one out of, I guess, a thousand under entrepreneurs under Telenor in, in Bangladesh uh, had used child labor. As long as you know that the company do its best to avoid this, they need to be defended. No one can run a program in Bangladesh without coming into no one in these kind of situations. No one can run a government aid program either without coming into this. So business, when they come into difficulties, as long as they do the, uh, that most to be uh, uh, on, the, on, on the right side, need defense, and politicians should defend business. So this is number one. Business should do what business at best at, and that is investing and reinvesting. And let's remind ourselves that this is the process which has brought us where we are. Most processes in history have started at some point which you cannot really pinpoint. This process started, it has a name and a place. It started in Manchester. Historians discuss whether it was 1770 or 1780. Let's leave that for the French makers. Uh, but it started in one place in the United Kingdom at that point and has spread to the rest of the world and we call it the Industrial Revolution. You need industries, you need productive forces. 
And if there's a singular process in the sense that it has not started, I mean, there have been more advanced societies. China for sure had a greater civilization than the United Kingdom for sure from any other parameter. But these processes started in the United Kingdom and development is about making certain that every other, every nation is able to tap into this. Second, we want business to work on the basis of good uh, governance systems or corporate so social responsibility. What does that mean? Uh, it does not mean to be perfect. And for sure, it does not mean to run a school or a kindergarten. Again, that may be nice, but that is not the issue. It is to run the core business in accordance with established norms. One of the most difficult many places will be uh, and uh, to do it without corruption. I will make a strong plea that this is absolutely essential because corruption is at the core of underdevelopment in many places. Money is stolen from the poor, taken out of the country, not reinvested in that place, and it's at the core of bad government system and is also a core of political leaders who simply steal from, from their, their, their society. One company I know very, very well, uh, they, was, well, they wanted to invest in an African country. They would have 50% of that investment. They would partner with a Japanese company who would have 30% of that investment. The government of that nation would have 10%. All fine. But then they were told that it would be a private, uh, uh, private company with a 10% of the same deal. That private company had no address, uh, no do documented production, no industrial capacities. It was very obvious that it was just a straw into that uh, program, program, which would give 10% to someone. Probably someone in the government or some relatives of us. Uh, these kind of deals we must avoid uh, and business should say no thank you and you should also say no thank you because it will lead you into trouble in the long run if you accept these kind of deals in the long run it will be exposed by civil society or by business or by someone uh, the, it, it's in many, many nations even illegal to get into these kind of deals and we will get into trouble but the more we can ex we can uh, make a level playing field the better it is if the company I think of, I can't name it, know that the competitors would not accept such a deal, it's much more easy to say no. It's much more difficult if you know that your Canadian co competitor will do it, or American, whatever. So, and that's also why OECD is spending such a lot of effort to establish global norms for business. I mean, this is also leading the uh, investment committee of the OECD, and this is at the core of the work, because a level playing field it makes it much easier to avoid uh, or avoid corruption and bad practices. You should establish high standard for environment. That's also absolutely crucial. And it's an area where business can play a very, very important role. Let me cite a very, very significant development which happened in December last year. This is the biggest palm oil company in Asia. It's called Vilmar. It's not a small niche company of the type I, as a green politician, would love to see. It's a huge company, close to 50% of the Asian market for palm oil. They made a decision, and they have been in the pressure from Greenpeace, true. And they were spending a lot of time in a dialogue with American think tanks who could assist them in getting the right business practice. But they made a public plea that from now on, they would not invest or, or do any business, which leads to the destruction of the rainforest. And it's much, much, much more important if Bilmar makes make such a decision than if you can get some small programs from a development agency. I mean, again, these programs may be nice, but this is much more significant. It's, uh, it's a game changer. Also because for sure, Bilmar, with the next step of Bilmar, will be to be pressure on the other companies for a level playing, playing field. Bilmar do not want to see others having higher profits because they can have bad uh, business practices. So you get the forces of business to put pressure on other businesses. So these kind of, true, these kind of pleas, I mean, media has to look into whether they follow them, and civil society should go after it, but it's, it is of enormous significance, and it's part of good corporate responsibility for this, uh, uh, this company. So good corporate responsibility of anti-corruption, 
on environment, but also to the extent that you can do, try to train local for local local staff, try to train local uh, uh, people working, and that's a problem in many many African nations because most of the investments so far are in the extractive industries. There are not a lot of trained oil workers available at the African continent. But on the other hand, unless we start that training, it will never happen. Uh, so you need to look into whether you can purchase uh, uh, locally and you can train people locally. And that's how European nations also developed at some point. I mean, we, we got investment from more advanced nations. In my case, in our case, with Norwegian business, they went to the UK and to Germany to see what happened there. Then they went back home to copy what the Germans and the UK had did. They got investment from these nations. Uh, and then we demanded that they should train other people. When we started oil business in Norway, we, we brought in every global company to invest, but we demanded that Exxon and Shell and BP and all the, all the others should train uh, local Norwegian staff as a, as a way forward. And that's for sure the way forward also for Ghana or Tanzania or Mozambique, from a lower uh, starting point, true, that unless they can train their local people, they will have difficulties in the long run. So no one can demand that every business should be perfect on this, no government is perfect, no civil society organization is perfect, but to look into how we can have the best practice for environment and the corruption and training of local people is very, very important. Then the third issue is taxes. Uh, we need business for production of jobs and prosperity, but we also need business to pay taxes. And in the long run, for sure, business uh, benefit from taxes. It may, I mean, no one knows taxes in the long, in the short run, you may think that you benefit from low taxes, but in the long run, you benefit from taxes. Not high taxes, but realistic taxes, taxes which are paid by everyone, and where there are as, as few uh, different holes to get through as possible. Because without taxes, it's very hard to establish an educational system, or building roads, uh, or creating health clinics, and business are dependent on all this. I mean, with, without proper education, it's very, very difficult to train the workforce. And I want many businesses who say that I will not go to an African nation because the cost of training the workforce is so enormous because the level is too low. While I could go to, say, Vietnam, because the cost of training the workforce there is much less and because they're already trained by a much better school system in Vietnam itself. So business need to pay taxes to provide for a public sector uh, which uh, can do all these support uh, structures which business also, also need. And uh, OECD has looked into what we see as bad practice of a number of global businesses and that is what we call transfer pricing you move the profit from one area to the other and you move it to the destination where the taxes are the lowest. The Chancellor of the United Kingdom, Mr. Osborne, made headlines all over the world when he pointed to the fact that three really big American companies, Microsoft, Google and Starbucks, do not pay taxes in the United Kingdom. They claim that, uh, they claim that the, va the value of the patents are so high that you you don't have to pay any taxes in the UK, you move uh, your, your tax, taxes to a uh, other destination which is lower. And for sure you all know, if they don't pay taxes in the United Kingdom, then we believe that they pay taxes in Burundi or Malawi or the Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the, the answer is, is obvious. So uh, we are working on assisting nations in providing not high taxes, but good tax system. And the more everyone pay, the lower the tax level can also be and still provide for, for, for the services and society uh, uh, needs. So we are working on trying to find, I mean, assist those uh, developing nations who want to uh, establish good tax systems and to make certain that businesses cannot move uh, profits around. What we should aim at is realistic, not super profits. Realistic profit is a necessary, I mean, that's the bloodstream of business, without that you, it cannot function. But there is no need for super profits, and particularly in the extractive industries, uh, there sometimes are. The father of the present president of, of, uh, of Congo, Mr. Kabila, 
He once famously said that what you need to make revolution in Congo, he said, is $10,000 and a cell phone. And he said, you take the $10,000 and you start uh, giving service to an army and you can get a substantial army in Congo for $10,000. You use that army to go and grab the closest uh, mine you can find and you use the cell phone to call a company who will, who, who will uh, assist you in, in buying uh, what you get out of that mine and then you get more money to purchase a bigger army. And I think that's what also basically how have to power in, in Congo. I mean, companies may dispute that, but for sure it's a, it's a truth at, at the bottom here uh, that in some states with very, very weak gov governments, uh, practices in extractive industries are bad, there are super profits, and money is used for very, very bad uh, purposes. I want so to see, I mean, to see how big money there is in extractive industries. I just, I, let me give you just one comparison. Uh, the, the state oil company of Norway, Statoil, last year paid more taxes to the state of Angola alone then Norway provided for 50 years to the biggest recipient of development aid in Africa, which is Tanzania. One year of oil taxes, more than 50 years of development assistance. For sure, the 50 years of development assistance may be more beneficial to the nation because it may be spent better, hopefully. Uh, that shows where the big money is. To establish a realistic tax system for oil and gas for mining and for all the extractives is at the core of African development. Clo close to 50% of all African nations today have huge potential uh, for an energy. So in Tanzania, Mozambique, Kano made huge gas discoveries, for instance. David, uh, Ghana has, has some, all over West Africa there are. Uh, if they can be taxed in a realistic manner, if they can get the financial management right, it's a fantastic opportunity to provide for education and health. So doing business right, uh, applying standards for corporate social responsibility, paying taxes. And the fourth area is that we should look into how governments can assist business more. Uh, for sure, every business in uh, uh, Austria would think that it's much, much easier to invest in Turkey or Brazil or China, which are middle-income countries, even in Ghana or Tanzania, that there is to invest in, say, South Sudan or Central African Republic uh, or Somalia. That, that's obvious. There is an enormous risk premium in some nations compared to others. Still, the poorest and most difficult nations need <coughs> private investment. In the long run, every issue will be easier to resolve if there is prosperity. And the only way out of this, as I can see it, no one, no one can demand that business should invest where it's most difficult unless uh, uh, there is a risk alleviation structure. We need to bring business and government together. Uh, aid budgets can take some of this risk alleviation. You can have different kinds of blended instruments. You can have guarantees for business where the business, I mean, say, Austria want to pr provide a hydroelectric power in Mozambique, which is a uh, big nation for hydroelectric power. Uh, the business investment can be business, but you can take out the added political and economic risk uh, through uh, aid uh, or, or state uh, support. These kind of blended e e uh, mechanisms are needed in the more difficult places. They may not be needed in China or Turkey, but they will tend to be needed in, the, in, in, in many African, uh, African nations. So please be innovative on this. A number of nations have been very innovative in, in making new, new, new systems. There is nothing wrong in this. Business need to have a profit to invest. There is nothing wrong to use development assistance in supporting, supporting, uh, supporting uh, that. There are a number of global initiatives which also could also potentially uh, join. You may have joined it for all, all I know. One of them is what was launched by President Obama when he visited Africa a few months back. He launched Power Africa. That's an, at the moment an American initiative with African governments to provide mainly uh, renewable energies to Africa. Still 1.5 billion people uh, uh, at the globe are not uh, uh, on the net or, or are not connected to the grid. And that's very hard, very, I mean, true, I mean, it's possible to, to learn and read, to read and write without a uh, bulb. 
possible. And it's much, much easier if you have a light at night to read and write. And for sure, if you want to introduce even the small milking machine, uh, you need electricity. We need to bring these 1.5 billion people to the grid. We need to do it in a more environmentally friendly uh, fashion. And this Power Africa is one initiative, which is a blending of pure, pure government investment, pure aid, there's pure private investment, and there is a huge number of different other structures in between the pure state and the pure government, different kind of blended instruments. And we should look into how this initiative can be a global one, not just an African-US initiative. There's a similar initiative in another area where Austria is strong, and that's agriculture. It's called Grow Africa. Again, bringing together the principal agriculture companies and fertilizer companies, those who sell agriculture products, uh, other companies, with African governments, and, and with development partners to provide some assistance for this. There are also banks into this. You, also, maybe part of it, I, I don't know, but these kind of global initiatives may make it easier for a I don't want to be impolite, but a relatively small nation like Austria, you are not the United States or China, uh, it may be easier for you if you can join in with bigger initiatives where there are other players. If Austrian business have difficulties, it may be also better and be more protection if it's within a structure where the United States is also a partner for make, uh, making this a, a success uh, story. Because at the end of the day, people tend to be more reluctant to make problems with the United States than they may be uh, ready to do with Austria or, or, or for, 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 that, uh, for that matter. So let me conclude. There is no real way to development without private sector. We need more and better private investment. Some people tend to believe that there is a contradiction between aid and trade and investment. I say yes, thank you. More aid, more private investment, more trade, all of these are by and large forces for good. We should not make intellectual constructions where we make these uh, forces. And finally, there is in most nations a need for a much better dialogue between private sector and uh, in public sector. In Northern Europe, which is the place of the world I know best, tendency is that people at the age of about 25 make the decision either to join the public sector or to join the private sector. And they remain in the public or the private sector for the rest of their life. And then we can easily have a private sector conversation about these lazy bureaucrats in the public sector who just make problems for private sector. And you can have a similar discussion in the public sector about these greedy private sector guys who are just there for profit and have no, uh, no uh, uh, dignity in life. Uh, truth is, we need a strong, vibrant private sector in combination with a strong public sector who is framing the market. That is the way to success.